Hello there. Uh, welcome. My name is Casper Melville. I am a senior lecturer in the School of Arts at SOAS. I convene the MA in Global Creative and Cultural Industries. And um, this is me giving you a little sample, a taster of the kind of thing that you can expect if you come to SOAS, if you come to do my MA or indeed other MAs in the department. Uh, where you can take my courses as options. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person live. I'm afraid I had uh, other, other things that have taken me away, but thank you for joining me for this recording. So, like I said, in this, in this um, recording, I'm going to give you a, you know, a kind of taster and I'm going to give you a sample of one of the lectures that comes from one of the courses that I teach, which I'll explain to you in just a minute. So let us start by me sharing my screen. And let me take you to this and we'll start from the beginning, shall we? Okay, so as part of the MA that I teach, Global Creative and Cultural Industries, I teach a module which is called the music business, which looks at all aspects of the production circulation of popular music. Um, it's a, it's a, a module that kind of stands alone. You can take it as an option. Lots of people who are doing a music MA or maybe doing history of art MA or indeed MAs in other parts of SOAS take this as an option, but it's also a required um, a course for the MA Global Creative and Cultural Industries. And, and a lot of the issues that I'm looking at in relation to music in the music industry uh, course are applicable across the creative economy. So as you can see, the title of this, this piece is gonna be, what is wrong with Spotify? And it's really about the politics of streaming. And when I say politics, I'm not talking about party politics. I'm talking about the debates about the nature of streaming. Streaming is something which you'll be very familiar with now, but it's a relatively new phenomenon, but it's transformed the way in which we consume cultural products, um, of course, in a huge way. I mean, throw your mind back. When I first started teaching this course in 2013, very few of my students were using streaming. Some of them had iTunes. Some of them were doing illegal file sharing one or two had started to use Spotify. Fast forward now to 2022 and something like 90% of the students in my music business class are streaming and not only are they do the degree of penetration of Spotify. So in this session, I just want to give a sense of the debate around Spotify, uh, what sort of creative industry scholars and various others have said about it and get some sense of you know, what it means and what and and how we can think how we can analyze it how we can think about it as a sort of new element of the creative economy so let's start with this proposition really which comes from an article by dave hesman house from 2020 dave hesman house is a cultural industry scholar he's written a very well-known book called the cultural industries but also um, recently has been publishing a lot of work on digital platforms like SoundCloud and Bandcamp and Spotify. And in the most recent piece that he's written, or one of the most recent, he makes this claim, which I think is a claim which he can justify using the data. Having declined for 14 continuous years from 2001 to 2014, the music industry began record growth. This growth was driven entirely by music streaming services. So the, the, the piece it read at the end, the recovery of revenues was almost entirely driven by the increasing use across much of the world of music streaming services. So the reason why the record industry's uh, revenues collapsed, of course, at the beginning of this, of this century is because of the impact of the internet and particularly what the so-called Napster moment. This was the moment of file sharing. This was the moment when people suddenly realized that they could swap files without having to route it through some kind of legitimate way of buying it. And there was this uh, a, a huge kind of moral panic in the industry or an actual panic about pi so-called piracy um, and revenues, music industry revenues consequently took a nosedive because of the end of physical sales, you know, no, the collapse of CD sales really. And it's only been since the emergence of streaming uh, initially around 2006, 2007, and then the way that built up laterally till the point that we're at now in 2020 when streaming is providing a bulk of the revenues in the music industry and revenues have bounced back now to the levels that they had reached in, at the beginning of the 1990s, the high point of CD sales. So in some sense, you might think streaming has resolved some of the big issues in the musical economy and you know it's something to be celebrated. This is just a chart, this is actually from 2017, so it's not you know, brand new, but it just gives you some, a sense of the kind of global penetration of streaming services. It's, not, it's, it's unevenly distributed around the world, and it's not completely dominated by you know, the Anglo West. As you can see, Mexico at, at that point at the top, was at the top with 75% of the audience who had streamed or used streaming. But you can see Sweden, Brazil, South Korea, 
Germany, Canada. Japan is an interesting case right at the bottom because Japan is a bit of an outlier in the music industry. And despite Japan's reputation for, for sort of being at the cutting edge of, of technology, is actually quite slow often to uh, adapt to new ways of, of uh, distributing music. So for example, you can still rent CDs in Japan in a way that you just couldn't, you can't in the UK. I mean, well, how would you do that? So that gives you a sense of the kind of global spread. Let's have a little think about how streaming services make money. It's not just Spotify, there are lots of others, but Spotify does tend to predominate because it's got the largest market share. They offer ad supported services. So the revenue is coming from advertising. Subscription, that's where you pay for a sub subscription. Everybody knows about this model now because everybody subscribes, not everybody, but probably you, to Netflix, Disney Plus, Spotify, Apple Music, I mean, subscription model is now the most, you know, the biggest and the biggest growing model within the creative economy. Some kind of hybrid of those two um, and also offers on demand access. That's the key thing about streaming, which makes it different from traditional forms of media like television, although, of course, we now stream television, so that's become complicated. But unlike television and radio, which are pre-programmed, the programs will come on a, at a given time and you have to be there to watch them. We're talking about on demand. This is you deciding what you want to listen to, what you want to watch by clicking a button. Here's a key point about these services. The majority of them are not profitable. Now, that's an odd thing to think is that they're successful, but not profitable. They generate money. They generate income. They generate income for the people who work for them and the people who own them and the people who own shares in them. And of course, uh, Spotify is a publicly traded company, but they don't actually turn a profit. You know, the vast amount of money that Spotify makes through streaming, through its subscription service is passed on to the record labels, which is why, you know, the music industry revenues have gone way up. But it doesn't actually make profit unto itself. And this is a very common model of, you know, internet based business. It's not initially it doesn't it's not in initially important to be profitable. What is important is market share. So what happens with a technology company like Spotify is that they emerge, they, they are given funding from people who back the idea and think it's going to be successful, so called venture capitalists or angel investors. Um, and then they go through subsequent rounds of funding, which keeps, uh, you know, allowing them to improve their their um, interface and to, you know, buy more things and build up their staff until they are so big that they have they can dominate the market. And at that point, often things change. I mean, you'll remember maybe when Facebook was in this position just before Facebook was profitable, it had a huge penetration in the global market and it then transitioned into basically the world's biggest advertising company and is now vastly profitable and similar with Google. So that's something to bear in mind when you're thinking about the, the economic structure of these new digital platforms. And of course, now there is there are some um, platforms which are which in this space which are profitable. So, for example, Bandcamp, which is a kind of uh, online record store, um, has reported that it is profitable. But and it's probably not coincidental that Bandcamp has just two weeks ago been bought by Epic Games. So this is about the model in which independents tend to be bought up by big, big players. Epic Games is partly owned by Tencent, which is a ginormous uh, Chinese um, internet company, uh, which also has a stake in Spotify. Okay, so who are the main players in the kind of stream music streaming world? Here's, here's a list of some of the biggest. Spotify is the biggest, 144 million paid subscribers. That's going up quite nicely or has been over the past few years although that growth has slowed somewhat as the penetration becomes you know a lot across the world apple music next with 60 million subscribers apple obviously the world's richest company has significant advantages because people have already got what used to be called itunes which has been rebranded as apple music if you have an iphone you've got apple music already on your phone or on your laptop um, and they've been you know, transferring those people who are owning the phones into subscribers to Apple Music. Uh, YouTube has a subscription service as well. They've got 20 million paying subscribers. I don't know if you pay for YouTube. I rather doubt it. 20 million is not that many comparative to the amount of people who actually use YouTube. And YouTube remains the number one place to discover music. It is the most significant music distribution site in the world, albeit that its, its business model is is different to spotify and apple and then there's amazon now with amazon as you'll probably know if you're an amazon prime subscriber it's bundled in with your prime subscription which is really to get kind of free delivery or to watch you know tv programs on amazon prime but you do actually get a music service bundled in with it i don't know if you know that or if you use it 
Um, it's hard to figure out exactly how many subscribers they have because, of course, the 150 million subscribers, like I said, are subscribing for multiple reasons, not just to get hold of the music service that they have. There are independents in the streaming sector. Some of the big independents, Idagio, they specialize in classical music. They tend to be niche in some way. SoundCloud, which I'll talk a bit about SoundCloud later on because they've got a new model, but they're very much about um, new music, especially kind of younger people's club based type music or hip hop. Um, producers upload their music which may not actually be released on a major label and people can follow you there's a social media aspect to it Bandcamp, i've just mentioned to you which has just been bought so no longer in indie arguably uh tidal this was the big experiment that um you know a bunch of um you know famous african-american artists including jay-z uh, established and rihanna in in the us which was designed to compete on the basis of having much better quality sound files it's actually been not a very successful uh, launch in business, um, something like 3 million subscribers, and it's now owned by Sprint, which is the, an American uh, t telephony company. And similarly, Deezer, which was the kind of French version of Spotify, is now owned by Orange, again, by a phone company. So you can see that at this level, there's a lot of integration between the platforms and the different services. And sometimes the music is there really just to be bundled up with other things to make the other subscriptions more attractive, very much like uh, the way that BT bought into sport, live sport, in order to drive the uptake of their on-demand TV services. There are there is global variation, of course. I mean, it's the huge, the, the the largest share of the streaming market is dominated by Spotify, which is Swedish, but really it's an American company now. And Apple, we know, is American. Um, but in um, in India, there's Geo Savan, which is a huge uh, Indian streaming service, 100 million active users. Um, and in Tencent in China, there's a whole, you know, in some ways there's more, there's at least two internets, if not more, but you know, there's an English language, English speaking internet, and then there's Chinese internet. Many of the same services are not available. China blocks quite a lot of services from, from outside of China, but Tencent is a huge company within China. And as, as you can see by the numbers, you know, 900 million users, you know, that's the scale of the, of the Chinese market and it's growing very rapidly. Now, what are the controversies associated with streaming? Well, here's some of them. The dominance of the platform capitalists, the way that platform capitalists, Amazon, Alphabet, who owns um, Google, Apple, and Facebook, these are the so-called platform capitalists, have dominated, have come to predominate in cultural production. They didn't initially start off as cultural producers, of course, they circulators, you know, they're like, you upload your content onto our site. We don't, we're not publishers, but actually now all of them have moved very strongly into cultural production. They make things. We know that Apple TV is making original programming. So is Amazon uh, and Facebook is, is moving into that direction as well. There are some anxieties about the way in which streaming in, represents a shift from buying music to you know, owning music and owning cultural products like you know your records on your shelf or your CDs or your DVDs to paying for access and what the implications are in terms of cultural value really in terms of how we value the products that we're getting access to and our our ownership of them do we take them into ourselves do we make them part of our of our kind of um you know our identities in the same way that we might with things that we buy do we have a same do we value them as highly and there's been anxieties expressed about that and there are issues around the con what are the consequences for pay for creatives pay here what you know what does it mean that this system is dominated by these very wealthy um, platform capitalists and are they fairly distributing the money that they are making especially back to those people who are actually making the culture itself who are making the music so those are three of the kind of key anxieties in this in this space now i'm just going to stop sharing for a second because i want to share something else with you i just want to show you this is just a sort of reminder um, of the vulnerability really of the way that um of the way that it's possible to so-called game the system now this is a rather sad bit of footage in one sense which is that it um it features michael k williams who sadly died quite recently um you may know him as the um the character omar in the wire but this is an investigation he did for vice which is this kind of hip young media company not so young anymore um which went to look at the so-called streaming farms and just have a little look at what happened yeah and stream their music to run the numbers up yeah yeah just basically just run the numbers up some people will ask for 100 pay 200 pay just to get really the appearance of their music to look good for people to 
people as long as that's enough for his holiness to do it. I want to come to a five, uh, a hundred thousand streams. How much would that, what would that look like? It's a point for around 1500 bucks. Streaming farmers are the engine of a booming black market. The music artists are faking their way to the top of the charts. How do your clients find you? Most of it's just word of mouth through referral services. Maybe it's a label or and or from the internet, and they're giving you a lot of business with all their clients. You've had A and R's and labels come to you. Yep, you've seen some of these prominent artists like French Montana. Maybe last year had a song ripped down, and that was a big Twitter thing, and. French Montana got caught up in a scandal when fans alleged that Fox had hacked their Spotify account to rack up streams of his music. The g Easy's management got caught red-handed in a leaked phone call. Maybe they don't know about all this stuff, but... Hey, no! Hey, they, 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 they know. Are you able to show me, like, your stream farm in action? Can I show you the bomb with all the servers on it? Basically, with 50 different computers that I can tap into and log in. At any given time. Yep. So I have them all set up with the bot. Say so I wanted to play a song for 60 minutes. I would just type in 60 here. So at 2 p.m., all of those servers are going to stream a particular song. Correct. Say if a song is, is three minutes long. So we're talking about 20 times uh, 50. Am I correct? In the space of one. I'm going to stop that there um, just so that uh, because you don't need to see much more of it, but that, I hope you get the point. There are streaming farms, streaming farms. You can pay them to run loads and loads of computers and phones, which will stream your tracks, which will push your, which will drive up the, the listens, uh, drive you up in chart position, make you more popular, make you more shareable. It's a way to game the system. OK, so let's go back to the lecture. And so here, um, oh, this is taking me back to the wrong page. OK, let's go here. So that was what I showed you just now. So the thing to bear in mind about these platform capitalists is that while we might worry that they're completely predominating in the, in the cultural space, that they have too much power, that they're generating too much wealth, they're not infallible. And in fact, they're in constant turmoil and they're in constant churn trying to figure out a business model that's going to work. I mentioned to you that Spotify is not profitable. So here's just a list of some of the things that Spotify have tried to do. You know, in some ways, there's a question about whether really they're a music company at all. Is music their primary concern? Because in 2016, there was a decision that they were going to pivot to video. Um, you know, that they, they wanted to make their service much more about video. And every now and then when you go and play a Spotify track, you, it, there'll be a little video playing. But in fact, that was a failure. It didn't really work. One of the reasons probably is that most Spotify usage is on mobile phones and people are doing other things, right? They're not sitting and looking at a video, they're listening to, on their headphones. In 2018, Spotify decided that maybe they should try and enter the space of labels, be a label unto themselves. At the moment, the way Spotify works is it works with record labels. You have to be on a label to get onto Spotify and the labels are the main recipients of the money that Spotify passes on, although some of that money is supposed to be passed on to artists and we'll get to that in a minute so they thought why don't we just let musicians come direct to us but in fact they got a lot of bad publicity and feedback from record labels who were threatened by this and who are you know an important part of their ecosystem and they dropped that then in 2019 there was this shift to podcasting and so uh, spotify started making some very significant investments for example buying gimlet media which is a big podcaster um, and you might be familiar, of course, with the controversy that was kicked up around Joe Rogan, who they paid $100 million for, for an exclusive to, to broadcast his podcast. Um, and then Neil Young, the musician Neil Young, um, who decided to take his content off Spotify because he was worried that Joe Rogan was spreading anti-vax, uh, you know, fake news. Um, that continues to rumble on that debate. The thing I'm focusing on here is the way in which Spotify pivoting to podcasting. Why? Why were they pivoting to do that? Well, because they have to give so much money to the record labels because of copyright. When you stream a song, money goes to the songwriter, the person who wrote the lyrics and the person who owns the recording. And that money has to, by law has to be passed on 
and therefore Spotify don't get a very high return on their investment. But with podcasting, that doesn't exist. You do not have to do that. You can generate, you can pay for the production of your own podcast and keep all the money that comes. There is also a huge $30 billion advertising pie for podcasts, which um, Spotify can also benefit from. So in the end, the people who analyze Spotify, one of the things that they say is that there's something a bit worrying about having a company which is so powerful in the music industry that doesn't seem to care that much about music. They would actually be, you know, they're actually concerned with making money. And the reason they're concerned with making money partly is because they have investors. They, they, they were taken to the stock market and they have to keep their shareholders happy because the share price is what really matters when you're a publicly listed company. This is Mark Mulligan, who writes for the Music Industry blog. It is tech growth stock, and thus its market value is defined more by what it will be tomorrow than by what it is today. This is what tech growth stock is all about. That particular. So really, it's not that much about music. And this is one of the anxieties that people have who care about music a lot, that what, you know, the com these kind of tech companies are using music to drive audience, to drive attention, uh, to drive advertising. But actually, do they really care that much about music at all? So here is three claims which are main, being made about the nature of streaming and what's bad about streaming. This is, again, coming from Dave hesman hausch's piece from 2020. The first claim is that the new system is damaging to musicians because not enough money is making its way into the pockets of musicians. There's too many middlemen and the per stream payout is too small in streaming. And we'll review some of those arguments in a minute. The second one is that these systems reproduce unjust systems of industrial power. So that argument is about how in the old model of the music industry, it was dominated by the so-called big six or then the big four, these huge record labels, which had a lot of power uh, practiced, you know, unfair practices, you know, very unfair contracts, um, you know, lots of kind of hidden clauses in those contracts and, and just had a lot of muscle in the system. And one of the promises of digital was that it would it would undermine that power, it would remove the middleman, it would create the possibility of going direct to the audience. But in fact, we've just got a new set of middlemen, these tech companies, and there's anxieties about that. And the third claim is that it's now harder for musicians to earn a decent living from recorded music. That's the kind of conclusion of that. It's like it's, things are getting worse, it's because of streaming, um, and it's reproducing an unjust system. Now, Dave Hesmanhaus is a, is a committed academic, and it's not that he disbelieves necessarily these claims, but what he wants to do is give a sense of proportion and a sense of what is the evidence. He's asking the question, on what evidence are we basing these assumptions? So it's slight, being slightly sceptical. So let me just give you some examples of the kind of arguments that, are, that, that, that Hesmanhaus is talking about. This is um, Tom Gray, who has become quite a well-known person, he was, he's a musician, he's in the band Gomez, but he started this campaign called Broken Record, which was all about highlighting the poor, the bad, low payments that were being made by the streaming services to musicians and saying how unsustainable it was and calling for a different system. So as part of the lobbying, you can see on the left there, this, uh, you know, here's a breakdown of the per stream rates that the different streaming services offer. Amazon, you'll get 0.009 of a pence um, from Spotify, even worse, 0.0028 of a pence for your streams, right? The number of streams to earn one hour's minimum wage, you'd need to stream more than 3000 times to get, just to get minimum wage uh, levels. So what we're talking about is, you know, how this is a system which benefits those people who can motivate millions of streams, things, people that, you know, are famous, Adele, Ed Sheeran, you, at that level, multiple millions of streams, you can make good money, but at much lo lower levels for the more independent artists, there's an anxiety about whether there's enough money being made at all. And there, then what happens to that money when it goes down the, down the chute, down the system? And one of the problems with assessing this is that a lot of that information is hidden away. It's considered to be business critical information. It's not shared by Spotify or the other streamers. It's hidden behind so-called NDAs, non-disclosure non agreements. And so it can be very difficult to, to generate the evidence. Anyway, some of the things that Tom Gray is arguing for here is that um, this system is very good for those people who have some very valuable copyrights. You know, if you're a major rights holder, and that's really what big record labels are these days, is they don't really manufacture anything because everything's digital, right? You don't need to really manufacture digital files. Um, but what they do is they own copyrights. And if they own enough of them, and there's enough streaming of their copyrighted material across a, the wide range of their catalogue, there is serious money to be made, but not for the individual artists. 
It will depend on the nature of the deal that the artist has with the label, but usually these will be in favor of the label. And his concern is also with songwriters and the flow of money, you know, that comes in, in for those people who've actually written the songs. And this is dictated partly by copyright law. So it can be a bit of a complex argument, but Tom Gray and the broken record um, sort of perspective is the kind of perspective that Dave Hesmanhaus is being slightly wary of because he thinks that maybe it's exaggerating the nature of what's wrong. Here's another example of a kind of anti-Spotify case. This is Liz Pelly, who's a journalist who writes for The Baffler and many other kind of independent publications in the US. She talks about Spotify's broken music model. She says it's a company whose product is fully built on exploited labor, the exploited labor of the musicians. She is particularly hostile to this thing called uh, Spotify Wrapped. I don't know if you're a Spotify user, but at the end of the year, they've started producing this little kind of mini, it's now like a little mini film, which summarizes your usage from the year, tells you what your most listened to track was, your, the new genres you discovered. And it's become the sort of thing that people have been putting around on social media sharing. And Liz Pelly and others have pointed out that really what's happening here is this is a very, very effective and very cheap marketing tool for Spotify. You know, while we're, you know, sharing our musical interests and taste, what we're really doing is is doing free advertising for Spotify. Do we want a publicly traded tech company whose only investment is to make returns to major labels and banks and investment firms, setting the terms of how value is decided across all corners of music? That summarizes, you know, the debate and summarizes the, the hostility that lots of people in the music industry or, or commentators on the music industry feel towards Spotify. But, and this is the Dave Hesman house, but, while musicians have, of course, always cobbled together income from multiple sources, it is not yet clear that in the new musical system dominated by streaming, it is harder for musicians to make a living than before. One of the things Dave Hesman House, who's a media scholar who's been working for you know, 40 years in, the, in that field, is determined to do is to give some historical context and to encourage you to think that, yes, it may be difficult to make a living as a musician now in the new streaming world, but it was always difficult to make a living as a musician. It was inherently precarious. The creative economy has always been built on risk and precariarity. It's never been that secure. Not that it shouldn't be made more secure, but that we can't blame that all on streaming. Um, he even argues, looking at the evidence, that it's possible that some musicians get more from streaming than they got previously. And I'm gonna revisit that argument right at the end of this lecture because I've got some new evidence for that. Now, one of the concerns around streaming, and this is a bit technical, but it, let me just summarize it for you like this. We imagine that we're, when, we're, when we subscribe or pay for these services, the money that we pay is going into this that we're listening to, right? Well, some of it does, but not all of it. And that's because they do not actually operate a per stream system. You know, I stream your track, you get one penny or one proportion of a penny from, of my money. It's not done on that basis. It's done on the so-called pro rata basis. So total monthly uh, revenue for Spotify is divided up between all the artists on Spotify according to how often they're streamed. And what that really means in effect is no matter that you might be listening to experimental Japanese punk or Estonian folk music or only listening to Stormzy, some of the money that you're giving to Spotify is going into the pocket of Adele or Drake or... Taylor Swift or name your other big artist, BTS. And some people think that that's unfair and they think there should be a much tighter relationship between you know, the listener and you know, I want to listen to and put money into the pocket of the musicians that I like and value and I do not want to just fund the big boys and girls. So some of the argument about streaming has been about shouldn't we change this system? Shouldn't we have a fairer system? And I'll show you an example of a system which has been developed in the light of that. So again, have a think about the, the, the problem with some of the claims that are being made. The way in which the apparently very, straw, very small per stream rates offered by the streamers are used as part of the argument about unfair, unfair systems of reward. That, Dave Hesmanhaus is questioning whether that mechanism of that argument is actually working properly. Are they entirely responsible for the problem or are they a symptom? Some of these arguments can tend towards simplification and there's, as I said before, there's very limited evidence on which to base some of these. So there's a kind of argument, what, what Dave Hesmanhaus and some of the other scholars are saying is let's slow down a little bit. Let's be comparative. 
let's think historically and in context and let's not just kind of rush into the hype i mean i must say amongst my students it seems like a pretty much of a norm that people are very critical of spotify and the amount of money that they're paying musicians albeit that they're also streaming at the same time which is an interesting uh, moment to be in isn't it when everyone's critical of something and yet they're also also uh, always also doing it and can't really imagine not doing it because there isn't really an alternative so I talked about broken record and this is just a kind of summary of their position and what they think should be done to fix it so I'm um, you know what they're calling for is a so-called user-centric payment system one that much more reflects the actual given usage interest musical taste of the individual subscribers so consumers can have their rights restored, right? They want their money to go to the artists that they want to support, not to everyone. It, they're calling for something, a so-called fair trade. They want the author to get direct compensation for the use of their art, rather than it being rooted through record companies. And this is partly to do with trying to chip away at some of the power that record companies have managed to reestablish in this period. And of course, there's this issue of cheating. And we've, I've just shown you a, a video about, about farming you know, stream farming streams, and it is a big problem. It's a, it's a system that can be easily gained. And therefore, it's something that we can't really trust. And so they're calling for mechanisms which address this and try and stop the inflation of, um, of streaming numbers. Uh, Damon Kr Krakowski, who's an, also a musician, is someone who has written an interesting piece, which was called How to Be Responsible, a, a Responsible Music Fan in the Age of Streaming. So he's not recommending that you get rid of streaming completely. Some, some people do. Some people say, just like when they're talking about social media, you should close down your Facebook, come off it, it's bad for you. Here's his, here's his kind of rules of engagement, how to be an ethical consumer. The first is he's, he, he's, he's interested in going local. He thinks that you should be trying to support your local music ecosystem. And he uses the example of the Grateful Dead here. The Grateful Dead, this American blues band from the 70s, who famously were followed by this kind of ragtag, multi you know, multicolored fans wearing sort of tie-dye t-shirts and taking a lot of acid. Um, and they built a very, very successful musical career, but they never really grazed the charts or weren't really part of a kind of global uh, pop phenomenon. And it was quite localized and it was very specific and niche. And he thinks that that's, there's a lot to be said for that kind of thinking, not global, but local. Consider your streaming use, he says, you know, just have a think about it. 90% of streams are of 10% of songs, right? 90% of the songs that are streamed in the world are only 10% of the available songs. They're all the, the ones that are huge hits the Ed Sheerans and the Adele's. If you don't want your money to go into their pocket, don't stream, right? You know that that's what happens, don't do it. That's one option. Or if you do do it, be acknowledge your own participation in that system. Care about the context, he says, you know, think about the, 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 the ecosystem with, which produces music. Um, this is the kind of activity you can do outside of the streaming ecosystem. Think about how you can talk up the bands you like, you know, share information about them. And one of the things that he says is that we should be sharing music a lot more. You know, there was a big crackdown on piracy at the beginning in the origins of the Internet age because it was considered to be, you know, killing off the industry and killing off musicians. And, and that, you know, there's an element of truth to that. But then on the other hand, sharing music, sharing what we like, supporting it going uh, using things like um, Patreon or other ways that to directly fund or buying merchandise or paying for tickets, you know, after COVID, obviously COVID, the, the, the live economy, music economy kind of collapsed under COVID. But as we recover, one of the ways we can support our bands, you know, the bands we like, the musicians that we like is actually paying for a concert ticket because much more of that money will go into their pocket than the streaming revenue. So those are some kind of guides on how to do it. Here's just some exa an example of some of, of, a, of a quite a smart move by SoundCloud. Now, SoundCloud is another uh, streaming site. It's slightly different from Spotify. I think I said before, it's much more about independent artists. A lot of artists upload music that hasn't actually been released or music that's a, a remix or something that they're trying out. It's more experimental. It's more artist driven. But they have just recently introduced what they are calling, what do they call it? fan powered royalties and this is precisely an attempt to kind of connect uh, the issue that people are criticizing spotify for which is how can we connect the money that, that the consumer has with the artist more directly i want to fund and support the artists i'm listening to and that's indeed what is going to happen as the only direct to consumer music streaming platform and the next generation artist services company 
This is the chief executive officer. He talks in that kind of language. The launch of fan powered royalties represents a significant move in SoundCloud's strategic direction to elevate, grow and create new opportunities directly with independent artists. So it's a very artist centered approach and it's got a kind of moral imperative. And it's almost saying, you know, we all know Spotify is immoral. Come over to SoundCloud. Whether it's working or not, we don't quite know yet. It's only been, was only introduced, I think, in 2020. It'd be interesting to know if you use it at all. None of my students have yet um, taken up the offer. So that all remains to be seen. Let me just leave you with a couple of final points on this issue, because there's a lot more. Obviously, I'm just scratching the surface of this. So one of them is underneath all of this debate about digital culture, about streaming, and about NFTs, you might have heard of those non-fungible tokens, you know, which is this other kind of new uh, mechanism of commodification within the cultural industries, is that they are incredibly environmentally expensive. We might, we sometimes get the impression that digital culture takes place somewhere in a nebulous nowhere, or we use these metaphors like the cloud, where's the cloud? It's nowhere in particular. Well, no, it's not nowhere. They, they're in huge server farms, you know, in the Mojave Desert, and probably also increasingly in the developing world very very expensive of energy especially fossil fuel energy which is what powers them so actually we are we is all of this debate really at the heart of it really a debate about environmental sustainability or should it be a debate and is streaming therefore going to be the best option if it's going to be so expensive this is kyle uh, devine who's an associate professor of music at university of oslo there is a widespread notion that music digitalized is music dematerialized the figures may even suggest that the rises of downloading and streaming are making music more environmentally friendly. But a very different picture emerges when we think about the energy used to power online music listening. Storing and processing music online uses a tremendous amount of resources and energy with a high impact on the environment. So actually, again, maybe we're thinking about streaming not as the kind of end result. For some, for people in the music industry, they may be thinking, great, we've been saved. No one's buying CDs anymore, but we've got streaming. But maybe it's a transitional technology and we need to be thinking, as Damien Krukowski said, we need to, Damien Krukowski, we need to think about new options, new ways of doing this, which, which are actually environmentally sustainable. But let me leave you with this very last point, because this is something I just learned this week. Uh, this, this gentleman, this great guy, Elijah, He's a grime DJ. He runs his own label called Butters. Uh, he, he puts on raves. You know, he's a sort of entrepreneurial young man. Um, you know, he's been doing it now for like 10 years. And he's also become a bit of a kind of, he's been posting a lot on Instagram advice to other people in the independent music sector, giving them advice about how to manage their royalties, about how to think about their, you know, world of work. Um, a very interesting man. And when he came in to talk to my class last week, one of the questions came up, which was, what do you think about streaming? And I think the assumption amongst my students and myself would be that as an artist or someone who represents artists, he might be a little bit, uh, he give that broken record type of argument, you know, it's very unfair, but he didn't say that at all. He said streaming has been really important to the sustainability of his business. And the reason why is because even though the payments are relatively small, they are regular and reliable, and they have created an income stream for him, which he contrasted with the income stream of what it was like before. Now, he's, he hasn't been around in music production long enough to remember the days of making loads of CDs or loads of records, although he does produce vinyl and CDs, but that wasn't the heart of the business because he didn't start until the 2000s. So the immediate environment that he's comparing it to is the environment of file sharing and downloading and illegal downloads. And he said that, you know, back in those days, people weren't paying for music so there wasn't revenue for the company or even if they were so if they were buying digital downloads he, he described the process as being well you would release this music people would buy a download and that would be it that would be the end of the income one payment per customer are done and then you move on but with streaming of course the tracks are always there and they're always available to be streamed and so he described a scenario where the income from streaming was actually a really important part of the business model now, it also depends on having an ethical relationship with your artists, which he certainly does have any profit shares with them. So, um, you know, because he's representing a label there and it could be that Spotify is very good for labels, but not so good for artists. But if you're a very artist centered independent label as Butters is, actually, maybe we should think of uh, streaming as being a vital component in sustaining an independent music economy. The other thing he told us, which was when we asked him, because he said that when um, when COVID came along, 80% of his, of his company's income collapsed because they did live shows 
and that a lot of their income came through live shows and clubs and selling merchandise at those events and that was completely killed off for two years and he doubted whether it would come back at the same level but the other thing he said was that a really important source of revenue is sync rights now a sync right is when you sell your music to a company a corporation you know for advertising or to put in a film significant money to be made from that and his basic principle was the way i do my business the way i run it the way i market myself is put out good music and that's the beginning and the end of the whole thing and then there are these new revenue streams which have emerged particularly sync but also streaming which are vital to the survival of an independent business like that so that is really the end of what i wanted to say to you um just to give you a sense of the kind of issues that we that we that i deal with in my core course which is called analytical approaches to the global creative and cultural industries we look at film we look at uh, journalism we look at uh, cartoons you know any any aspects of the cultural economy alongside music then there's a there's also a course which is specifically about the film industry and the independent film industry and issues like festivals and alternative forms of distribution taught by my colleagues Lindy Wedovi and uh, Estrella Fernandez and then I teach the music business course from which that is taken so if you are interested please do contact me about any aspect of this or if you're interested in in maybe um, coming and doing an MA in creative industries at SOAS, cm54 at soas.ac.uk. My name's Casper. I'd be very happy to talk to you. Thanks a lot for listening. Goodbye.